Hey, welcome to uh, SHS 367. It's the intro video right now. There we go. Okay. Couldn't see anything. Okay. So this is the intro video for SHS 367 or language science. Um, so let's talk about the class a little bit. Um, this is a podcast based class, which what does that mean? It means that most of you um, online students are not like my in-person students. You have other things going on. You've got kids, you've got jobs. And then there's other things aside from those two. Those are the big two. Um, not everybody does, but some of you do. Most of you do. Um, the videos that I usually have, uh, some people say are a little bit restrictive. They have to watch a lot of videos while they're um, trying to make time in their schedule for all this other stuff. And so I thought this class in particular, um, not like anatomy and physiology, you can't really do a podcast podcast based anatomy and physiology. There's too many things to actually see. But in this one, you, you could. Um, this is going to let you uh, listen to the lectures while you do housework or drive, mow your lawn, uh, wash your clothes, whatever. Um, I drive a lot listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, the podcast is called The Psycholinguist. It's on CastBox. It's also posted directly to Canvas. CastBox is free. Canvas, of course, is also free. It's what you have access to already. Um, what I want you to do is, before you listen to this, uh, look at the show notes. There's going to be notes that go along with it, either in the podcast app or on canvas it's going to say show notes look at those there's some pictures uh that you might need to look at before listening to the uh, podcast or you can look back at them later or both which might even be a better idea there are still powerpoint slides so the first iteration of this class i didn't have slides it was just the uh just the podcasts i think the slides will help when you go back to study, it's going to cue a lot of things. And what I'm going to try to work on this semester, although we'll see, is syncing up the audio from the podcast to the slides. And then you'll actually have like a YouTube video that you can that you can watch like a typical lecture. Let's see though. I don't know. So if you decide to download Castbox Podcast Player, which again is free. Um, it used to just be free, like you, you download it and you'd use it. It's still free, but they try to get you to pay for some premium thing and they make it look like they're tricking you into it. So I'm not a fan of this, but I'm going to show you right now how to get past it. You're going to download it and it's going to say it's an advertisement about itself. Okay, whatever. You can enable offline listening, which means it's going to download uh, the episodes for you. This, of course, is up to you. But the not now button is up above continue. So what I want you, okay, watch this. Watch where the continue button is on all these. Continue is the large black button. Continue is the large black button, or you can say not now. Then they want you to log in. And the, the Facebook sign is the large black button. If you don't want to do this, which like, why would you? Um, then you can click not now, which is right above that button. And then they're going to take you to premium. And the big black button is three days free trial. And above it, where you usually click not now, is $3.99 and $7.99. You're looking now for this X up here at the top, which didn't used to be there. It's really, it's just so jerky. Um but it's free. Like, click on this. Do not pay for this. And then you're good. You can listen to it. So this is from my computer, but it looks the same. Well, actually, if you... This is not from my computer. This is from my phone. Um, this is from my phone. This is what it looks like on mobile when you download the app. So if it's on your iPad or a tablet or a phone, it's going to look like this. If you just go to the web address for this, like their website-based one, the browser-based version of this, um, you don't have to put up with all this junk. You can just go straight to uh, listening to the, the lecture for the class. Anyway, here's what I want you to know. Important stuff on the bottom, 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 top. 
They've moved it to the top. Click the X. Don't buy this. I guess unless you want to. But don't do the three-day free trial. You'll forget, and then they're going to charge you. It's ridiculous. Okay, let's talk a little bit about me. So I was born this... If you've had other online classes with me, you know that... Um, you know that usually my students are not from Arizona. So, meh. Um, usually people are really excited about, uh, all of my Arizona stuff. Cause they're also from Arizona, but online, not so much. I was born in Mesa. That's a city in Arizona. I graduated from Hamilton, which is in a different city in Arizona. And then I went to ASU for my bachelor's of science, my master's of arts and my PhD mm -hmm. before getting the PhD. I was an actor. This is me in a movie. Um, it's very thin. Mm -hmm. I went over and worked at a radio station for a while where they fed us free food. Stopped being thin. Um, this is a fun job. I think you can probably tell exactly what's going on here, but this was the sports guy. This is the news guy. And we did music. So, great. I actually did production stuff, but I was... I came from music to do production. So we were all the station uh, managers. And then I also run. Uh, this is a lot more recent than the other two pictures. Um, my PhD is in cognitive psychology, which is actually cognitive science. We don't call it cognitive psychology anymore because it really doesn't have anything to do with psychology. Cognitive science um, is essentially where biology, mathematics, physics, a little bit of psychology and biology mathematics physics is that it biology mathematics and physics and a little bit of psychology it must be oh and neuroscience come together um that's cognitive science uh and my specialty was auditory and visual perception so like seeing things and hearing things the hearing things part is how i ended up uh, in the speech and hearing uh, area. So here's some of the research that I've done. Um, I'm guessing you've probably had one of my classes before, so I'll go through the swear word thing sort of quickly. Also, we talk about it in this class, so that's another reason why I'll go through it very quickly. But essentially, if you look at swear words, which are in the dark bar on this graph here in the center, and regular words, which are in the light bar, you see that some phonemes, like the a phoneme right here, are used a lot more proportionally in swear words than they are in regular words. Um, and then also, uh, there's an interesting story about uh, there's a stressed uh and an unstressed uh schwa, which is just like information. It's that part at the end of shun. That's the unstressed uh. If you break it down by stressed and unstressed, you actually see that swear words use a uh, lot more than regular words. They don't use schwa hardly at all. Um, they're just mostly not long enough to have an unstressed vowel. But so a and a uh, are some of the biggest swear word um, phonemes that there are is another one, but that's not uh, significantly different than regular uh, usage for i. There are also some that are used more often in um regular words and they're used in swear words like e and oo oo and e uh, and if you think about those e and oo tend to be the sounds that get used in like parentese when you're talking to a baby or a dog e and oo so it's an interesting distinction there we'll talk about it more in the class um I've also done some work with the Dune Dune talking drum. Uh, so what we do is uh, this drum can change instead of just a regular drum, which is like da -da 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 -da. this drum, this guy is holding it like this. And what he's going to do is kind of like put it in either a tighter or looser headlock. And that's going to pull on the strings or loosen the strings. And so it'll go like doom, 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 doom. So it changes its pitch while it changes or while it's uh, like being a percussion instrument as well. Um, what's cool about this is 
if you speak a tonal language and Nigerian is a tonal language, Nigeria is where the dun dun is used most often, you can use the drum to replicate the language and people can understand what is being said by just listening to the pitch changes on the drum. Really cool. So the research we did was we just looking at uh, how closely the spectral and timing information uh, overlap between the drum and the speech. And it's very close. The people that are doing it, uh, that are playing the instrument, are um, replicating speech almost exactly. It's really cool. Uh, so that's this citation down here. Um, we got tons of attention on Twitter for that, which was awesome. Not as good as actual, like, uh, citations and other research, but, you know, it's still cool. Uh, tetrachromacy, not a whole lot of overlap between what we talk about in any of our speech and hearing classes in this, but I'm looking, doing research on finding a fourth color cone in humans. This is an article that was written about my research in psychology today. And then also we're going to talk about this in class, but this is another article that is doing fairly well that I wrote about memory, memory foraging, uh, and bringing up, uh, ideas and concepts which of course is psycholinguistics. And that's what we are talking about in this class. So we're going to talk about that more later on. Uh, you'll see all sorts of graphs and stuff like that when we, when we get to it. Okay. Let's talk about the schedule of the class. Um, there are four exams, but your lowest one is dropped. All of these exams are completed online. That's obvious. This is an online class. Uh, that's probably left over from one of my in-person classes. There are eight quizzes. What I want you to do is treat the first run through of your quiz like an exam. So don't use any notes. Uh, take it just right out of your head and see what's going on. Look at your answers, see what you got wrong, learn from it. And then the second attempt, pull out your notes and do really well on the quiz. So I want you to get 100% on the quizzes the second time around. First time around, treat it as, you know, like a learning, a learning attempt. Um, third thing, there are homeworks in this class as well. There's sentence diagramming, some hands-on research, and competitions with your family or friends based on different things that we're going to talk about. Uh, those are pretty short and pretty fun but that's what is in the class. So there's some readings. Obviously, there are some listenings that you have to do, some podcast listenings, uh, some readings from the book, uh, four exams, eight quizzes, and various homeworks. Let's talk about the exams. The exams are... Um, I had to change the exams because I used to leave them open for people to look at what they got wrong after they took them. Of course what happened with that. It's the best way to learn, right? So if you see the mistake you made, you can correct it in your brain and figure out how you're thinking about it wrong. But when it's open like that, people will take screenshots of what you've got and they will put it online. And so now we can't do that anymore. Some other things that we had to change about the exams. The exams are closed note. Uh, we're going to use, which has always been the case, um, respond to lockdown browser, always has been the case. 90-minute uh, time limit, which is new. I used to just give you all day. And uh, you can't go back. So answer your question, and then it's going to lock. It's going to prevent you from going back. So do not leave any blank thinking that you're going to come back to them. Just Take it. You have 90 minutes. There's 30 questions. You have plenty of time to like process the question. Don't leave a blank. Okay. What? Okay. There uh, will likely be extra credit in this class. Uh, what you'll do is you'll participate in a research study, either mine or somebody else in the department. You'll get credit for it. Um, and it usually takes no more than about 30 minutes. So a lot of them are 10 minutes. Um, if there are no studies to participate in, I'll have at least one other extra credit thing for you to do. Hey, the DRC stands for the Disability Resource Center. Sales stands for Student Accommodation. I-L-S. I don't remember what those are. But 
it's the same thing as the Disability Resource Center. It's the new name for it. Um, you should visit them digitally or in person if you think that you could use some accommodation in person. Of course, if you're here in Arizona, digitally, uh, if you're anywhere else, they've got a ton of people that work uh, online with Zoom. Um, some things that you could use accommodations for are obvious. So like if you have been injured partway through the semester and you need accommodations, contact sales. You can also, you know, email me with a, uh, with a note, doctor's note or something like that. And I can give you a couple extra days if there's an injury uh, or an illness. Um, doesn't hurt to also talk to sales about that. These are the obvious things. There are also other things dyslexia, test anxiety, auditory processing disorder that sometimes you'll know about, but sometimes you won't. In fact, I actually had a student who didn't know that they were dyslexic until we were talking about um, a font called Open Dyslexia, which I will have a link to later. Should have put it in the slideshow. Oh, well, just, just popped into my mind. Um, so I was talking about open dyslexia and this person says, wow, that's really easy to read. And I said, that's, that's what people who are dyslexic say. And uh, the more he's looking at this, he realizes like, oh man, I didn't realize that it was that people who aren't dyslexic are reading those words and other words exactly the same way. For him, it was so easy to read these open dyslexic uh, font words um, and not regular words. He realized I may have been dyslexic my entire life. So he went to the DRC and uh, took a test and it turns out, yeah, he was dyslexic a little bit. I mean, it, it enough to hurt his, uh, his grades. In fact, he, after he realized this, he told me about his issue, we looked at some of his tests and what was happening was he would do really well on the first three quarters of the exam. And then the last quarter, he just didn't have time to get to. And it's all because of his reading speed. So now he uses the open dyslexic font and he's fine. This is a couple of years ago. He's uh, now in med school and he's doing really well. So what I'm saying here is if you think that there is some issue that's going on with you, that's preventing you from being able to do your work, in the way that you want to do it, like dyslexia or auditory processing disorder or anything like this, you should contact sales. They have tests that you can take. Um, and the thing is, it never hurts to see. If you don't qualify, nobody knows. I'm not even notified that you went in to see. None of your instructors are. It's between you and the one person at sales that is giving you uh, the assessment. If you do qualify, it could mean the difference between like succeeding in college and not succeeding in college. So there's really no, there's no downside, right? It's not like if you don't qualify, they're going to say like, hey, you're just trying to get uh, free time on your exam. No, they're not going to do that. And nobody else is going to know. None of your friends, family, instructors, nobody knows. It's not, it's not information that goes anywhere. If you do qualify, of course, then your instructors are notified uh, if they need to be, depending on the issue. Uh, that you should have extra time or they can set you up with um, like a they'll teach you how to install the font on your computer. Let's say if you're dyslexic, it's not something I need to know about. So they won't notify me or any of your other instructors, but they'll teach you how to install a plugin on your computer that'll turn everything into a font that's uh, better for you. So again, never hurts to see. One last thing is um, I come from a diverse background. I'm also on the CHS JEDI Council. JEDI stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And then we call it the council because we're dorks and we like lightsabers. And then I'm also on the HPEN, in the HPEN group, which is the Health Policy and Equity Network. Uh, and so why I'm telling you this is because I believe in equitable treatment for everyone. And there's some issues uh, that I talk about in other classes that are related to this, especially 205. So if you've had that with me, we've talked about some of the health uh, equity issues um, based on any way that you can break down people, um, you know, race, socioeconomic status, uh, gender, um, neurotypicality, all, all this stuff. 
Uh, problem with this class is there's not a ton of things that end up being diverse topics. So it's an important issue. There's not a ton. There's just not a ton in psycholinguistics, really. There's one. There's one that I can think of. I'll tease it right now. We might talk about it later. But essentially, um, other accents. It's not even accents. It's like other ways of speaking that exist in the in the United States. Um, an accent could be part of it, but not always. Anyway, it's just like ways that you're putting words together differently. A lot of times people think that this is that you don't know proper English, um, but actually this has been charted. There are, and, and the way that the words come together is the same every time. The thing about languages is the only language that we use somewhat regularly that doesn't change is Latin. It's a dead language. Nobody is using it day to day. So it's dead and it is like in stone. That's where it is. In fact, that's why it's used to name a lot of scientific things because it's never going to change. The meaning of some Latin word xiphoid process if you've taken 310 uh xiphoid is never going to change it's not going to be something that in 100 years means you know some kind of uh ice cream bun which sounds delicious it's not gonna it's not gonna be that way um because it's dead people don't use it in their day-to-day -day language english of course is used uh in many countries um, it's people's, a lot of people's primary language. And because it's somebody's primary language, it's going to change over time. Slang is one way that it changes, but also the way that words come together is another aspect that changes. And that doesn't mean that the words are coming together incorrectly. It doesn't mean that the people that speak that way are stupid or even necessarily uneducated. What it means is that that's a new way that words are coming together. Now we have ways of finding out is this person somewhat developmentally delayed or is this a dialect? And the way that we do that is, is there a rule to the dialect? And so if there is a large group of people that talk in a certain way, uh, we can measure the consistency of how this is done. You know, are articles dropped? Are certain articles dropped? And are they the same over time from one speaker to another? If they are, this is a dialect, not a disconnect between the actual language that they should be speaking. If, on the other hand, this is not something that a lot of people use and one person is using it wrong and they're inconsistent with it, well, they may have a, a learning disability or something like that. It's a totally different subset of people. Um, one of these languages, this is a stupid name for it, but this is just what it's called. It's African-American vernacular English. Of course, it's not all African-Americans who speak it. And it's also not just African-Americans who do speak it. But that is what the language is called. And uh, some some linguists would assume that it's a, you know, like, oh, it's a corruption of, of American English. Well, it's not. It's its own separate uh, dialect. So there's real grammatical rules uh, to this and, and other dialects. If you look at Europe, the difference between French and Italian, there's a, there's an okay difference between there. But as you move over in France towards Italy, there are a ton of little towns uh, that speak something that's a little bit like French that has an Italian influence or Italian that has a French influence. And like, where's the dividing line to say that this is a French language and this is an Italian language? They're all dialects of one another. You can understand what the other person's saying. You can probably even uh, make yourself speak that way after listening to it for a little while. Uh, it's a dialect. It's not a, it's not incorrect. It's just a dialect. So that's one of the topics, only really the only one I can think of in psycholinguistics. That's a diverse topic. Everything else, we're just kind of looking at how the brain works. And the brain works mostly the same way for everybody. So, okay, that's the end.
here's the thing that I have up for you to do. Uh, it's where we're all going to talk about, man, I always forget this. It's either our favorite, I think it's favorite book. Yeah, it's favorite book in here. It's favorite book. Uh, so mine is House of Leaves and a couple other things that I'll talk about in there as well. So it's a discussion board. Just go in, talk about your favorite book or podcast or whatever. And um, I'll see you in there. All right. Oh, yeah. I just forget I have to like move to another screen and hit stop. Okay.